Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the closing party of the 2021 uh, group photo show with our amazing artists who joined us today. I'm Dave Backus from the uh, Brownstone Art, uh, along with Josh Vogelin, our curator, and Taylor Backus, our social media curator. Hi, nice to meet you. And if you haven't met already on their show, this is Todd and Terry. They're our co-hosts and moderators of today's show, so welcome them. And I'm going to let them uh, get the party underway and start uh, and proceed. Thank well, you. <laughs> thank you, David. And uh, thank you, Josh. And thank you, Taylor. Um, we are both uh, really honored that you asked us to do this. We've really enjoyed. Uh, well, first of all, we we loved how we got here, which was through the Mike Rader card unboxing, which was kind of a nice introduction to you guys. And, you know, we've had we've had some communication. We've, we really enjoyed that. Uh, we're getting this opportunity. So uh, we're excited. And also we have dug pretty deeply into this show and the artists that are in this show. Mm -hmm. we, we love this group photo show. We're excited. Oh, we did. There's lots of rabbit holes to go down. So I loved exploring all of their work. Yeah. And I'm really excited to talk to them. Well, you know, as, as some of you may or may not know, Terry is one of those rabbit hole people. So sometimes she can disappear into the computer for more than a day at a time and Possibly. never come up for air. So, yep. you know, if you need to know anything about these artists beyond what you see in this show, you know, you can ask me, but ask her. Or um, ask them. That's why we're here. Well, that's why we're here. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So should we do some introductions? We certainly can. So we're going to, we're going to introduce you to each artist and go through a brief survey of the works that are in the show. Um, we're going to move through them, not at a quick pace, but we really want to give them an opportunity to talk. And we really want to have, you know, questions raised so that mm -hmm. the Q&A is lively and, and, you know, fun. Yes. And their bios are up on the website as well. So you could read more about them there. Um, when we were structuring the bios I actually took a cue from Omar Viegas because he had one of the most poetic bios I think I've ever read and yeah. I'm like you know what let's go with this kind of format because I'm really digging it yeah so, I loved that bio yeah. so that kind of cue that kind of gave us the sort of uh that was the impetus for us to write a a, a quick and poetic kind of intro for this so yeah. um so yeah. Okay. So do you want to you want to take it away? I'm going to actually cut to some images right now. So that, that can, sounds good. So and we're gonna going to basically on. introduce them in the order in which they appear in the show. So the first artist we have up is Omar Viegas. He was born in the Bronx, Brooklyn raised. He has Guatemalan roots. Um, some of the awesome lines I was picking up from his bio, he says he trolls the streets like a hunter on safari. Which I love. Um, I love that. Yeah, I love that too. Shoots uh, 35 millimeter to 4K. Very poetic. He's our first one to introduce. And our second artist to introduce is going to be Mandrake the Black. And so when I had to go through and try and put together my bullet points for Mandrake the Black, this is a hard guy to pin down, I'm going to be honest. Um, so first of all, he's very well traveled. He's done a lot of amazing projects. And the works that are in this show are actually just the beginning. It's just the start of the rabbit hole that one could go down. And uh, he, he tends to be very balanced between the detailed and the vague, uh, mm -hmm. balanced between the clean and the gritty, and definitely, definitely mysterious, deeply very connected mysterious. to light. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited, actually, to have a conversation with him him and about his work. Mm -hmm. You're up. And our next one is Stefano Ortega. He's Italian born with Argentinian roots. Um, he has a fine arts degree from the University of Bologna, moved to New York to pursue photography at 24. Um, he bridges the divide between portraiture and documentary, um, and he loves to travel. You can definitely see that in all of his work and even in some of the slides that we're going to look at today. Yeah, definitely. All right. Next artist up is Blaze Hayward. So again, Blaze Hayward, you know, Toronto born artist, photographer and sculptor based in New York, um, you know, deep connection to people and nature yeah. in the work that I was able to mm -hmm. see and pull up and really enjoyed that. There's a fantastic fantastic body of work in this show if you have not actually gone and looked at it yet, which we will talk about. But I have to tell you that if you ever wanted to see a more gorgeous website. Oh my God. A, a more yes. beautiful place to go and just, yeah. yeah. So uh, Blaze's yeah. work is really uh, spectacular. So looking forward to talking yeah, to absolutely him. Absolutely beautiful. All right, you're up. Our next artist is Betsy Nagler. She is a Brooklyn-based filmmaker. She studied political science and photography at Stanford. You can definitely see some um, political 
uh, associations in a lot of her work. Uh, she has an MFA in film production at NYU. Yeah. Okay. And uh, am I up now? You're Is up. it me? All right. So uh, next on board, we have David Scott Leibowitz. And uh, David Scott Leibowitz has a 45-year-long career uh, in photography, collage, video art, experimental filmmaking. Um, his artistic fo focus shift during the Almeida fires in 2020 in Oregon, which actually sort of uh, shifted the way that he looked at and made work, which made it uh, really quite uh, an interesting process from which these images in the show are based on. So we're really looking forward to sort of talking to him about these and that process. And now to you. And finally, we have Jim Richards. He's, I love the way he described himself because he said he's a maker. That's first and foremost. He's a maker working in photography, sculpture, and paper. He lives in New York City. A deep involvement in wonderment and tactility, really. And I love how he does the infrared because we have a green screen and we wouldn't be able to see some of these images. Oh yeah, that's true, it's true. right? Because yeah. the, well, oh, that's right. That is right. I was thinking about that right now as we're putting them up. Yeah, so we'll talk about that a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, but we'll talk about that in a few. Later. So those are our seven artists that we have mm -hmm. and um, we're gonna get to talk to each one of those. So um, let's see, I think we should kick off with some some questions. I think I'm, so. I'm really, I'm really happy to introduce all of them, and I, I would like to welcome them on, um, at least on our behalf. I'm really excited to have them here. I am too. All right. Yeah. All right. So, can we do some questions, you guys? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I hope that was okay. <laughs> all right. So, first up, I really had. Um, I really had struggled with how to begin what we were going to be asking and, you know, where we should sort of take this from. So the first thing, you know, as we sort of dug into this show, uh, we, we were really thinking about the curation. And so Josh, Josh Vogelin, who is sitting in the center uh, on your screen right now, um, I'm curious about how, uh, I've got a couple of questions for you. Primarily, can you talk a little bit about how you chose the body of artists, obviously, and what continuities do you feel run through this show? Like, what do you feel are the uh, the threads underlying all of this? Okay, yeah. So I, you know, to start in terms of how we came to this particular body of artists, um, David and I worked together, and then with Taylor uh, to kind of pick the direction of the show. And photography was a medium that the gallery hasn't explored yet. So we knew that coming into this, we wanted to work with photo. Uh, you know, and part of that also has come up in that existing in this digital space, what work presents well on screen versus being seen in person. And so we wanted to experiment with that and see how photo translated to this digital only medium. Uh, from that, the particular body of artists that we have, it was we're aware of this huge wealth of photographers, both that work professionally as photographers and then also as people who that's their artistic practice that we all know from other professional capacities. And so it was, let's find a group of people who are almost as different as possible in their application of the medium and actually try and connect it that way. Because I had this fear when we started looking at a lot of the photographers that we really loved, that you were just looking at sort of iterations of the same thing. So maybe they were really great fashion photographers or still life photographers, but there was nothing that would bring you through an entire show and sort of like tell a story. And so this was, how do we really take these unique perspectives and show how different a medium can be, hmm. even though it's all film or digital, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. And I think this one in particular was really collective between all of us, you know, thinking yeah. about and talking about who we know and whose work mm -hmm. we've seen and, you know, like felt something, you know, special evoked by that work right. and something yeah. that intrigued us and kind of looking at them all together. Um, and, you know, people we had each worked with, but then discovered, you know, their other medium of work that was maybe not just the professional right. work and that, you know, you know, through, you know, Instagram, even you got mm -hmm. to really see the work present itself there. And uh, so it was just like, yes, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, yeah, exciting to get to reach out mm -hmm. to all these people that we knew and, you know, loved their work and were like, okay, we, you know, we, we want to work together and have this totally different kind of partnership, even though like, hey, we've worked before in a different kind of capacity, but. Yeah. So we weren't cold calling photographers, uh, people we knew. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, and you know, it's funny because when, when Josh points out that, you know, you were trying to approach it from as many possible ways that you could fitting inside of the digital, uh, you know, what you wanted to sort of present, 
I'm, I'm, I'm frankly surprised in that, you know, there, when we come to a show like this in, and, and we're trying to find ways to sort of discuss the work as a whole, you know, because it's all sitting under one roof, you, you begin to draw lines, you begin to sort of make connections yeah, between these the parallels works. parallels that were coming up. Yeah. And, and we've, we've found a number that we're really interested in hearing, you know, your thoughts on and the, and the various artists thoughts on as well mm -hmm. in this. So, um, so that's, that's really actually kind of cool that, the the works were brought in as being different, mm -hmm. but then ultimately wind up having these kind of connections, which, yeah. yep. you know, so, um, all right, Terry, do you want to, do you want to ask the group something? Uh, yeah. So feeding off of that line of thoughts, um, there were a couple of similar qualities that we were seeing in some of the work. So uh, in some of them, we're seeing elements of isolation. Uh, how do you react to this suggestion? When we were looking through a lot of the pieces, we could find a feeling of isolation. And bleakness, and but bleakness. also beauty. And beauty, right? lots of beauty. Um, um, well, I had kind of said beauty and the bleak. Yeah. Right, because there's kind of these two there is. It's, simultaneous it's this things. Simultaneous thing. Um, how do you guys react to that suggestion? Do you feel that some of your works or even some of your processes have been influenced by this concept at all? And we're throwing that out there to all the artists. So Everybody. you guys, all of you chime in and um, we, we would love to hear from you and see you know, what you think on that as well. Just in terms of how does that fit in? Just as a, if, we, if we called it an underlying theme, which we're not gonna necessarily you know, formally call it, but how do you react to that? Anyone? Yeah, for my work, you're 100% right. That's what I look for. Lonely, bleak, but finding beauty in that loneliness. And it's like, I don't know why I'm drawn to that, but that's really, I don't like shooting happy stuff. You know, I like shooting dark, depressing, bleak, lonely, yet to me, there's a big, there's a, a beauty to it. So I think you're right for my, for my work. Cool. Cool. Yeah, because there's an excitement, Mandrake, in your work, there's a sort of, uh, just in terms of your, your use of light, your use of color, the way you compose things, there is definitely that beauty aspect in there, even though it is conveying that other side of things. Um, so, so I want to talk more about that. And I don't want to dig too far outside of the work that's in the show, because we've looked at a lot of your work. But that's, that's, a, really, that's a really good point. What do the rest of you think about this and how it relates? Are you... The word are you re referring to the word like bleakness or isolation what's the um well i would say that either isolation bleakness but at the same time i mean and, and those two things if we call them on the dark side of the spectrum we can also talk about the beauty associated with those things or that maybe we're finding in those things are you and you're referring to the work in the show or just our work in general um well in the show, we're seeing that theme, but when we look at right. your other pieces, especially yours, I'm not, I'm not necessarily seeing that in all of your work, uh -huh. but when you bring all this work together under one area, and sometimes it's even the psychology of the curator, like um, in this particular show, that was something that we noticed. Do you, do you feel that you're looking at ways to isolate certain aspects and draw the focus to them or was it a mood that you were feeling yeah like blaze in your work in these in these isolated um poppies that are sort of in a state of decay you know i feel like that was definitely a move you made number one because of the isolation we were mm -hmm. in right you kind of had to move it indoors on some level but it also obviously i think sort of emulates that feeling right i mean these are things that are beautiful but dying mm -hmm. Well, what happened with me was uh, in March in New York, uh, everything just kind of came to a screeching halt. It was really an eerie place to be. And um, I uh, have a little studio down in NoHo area. And I, I, I stopped even going there. I went down one day, piled a whole bunch of equipment in my car, and then I took it to my apartment. And I set up a little home studio there. And then I started going to the flower district and I just bought a ton of flowers, as much as I could carry. I was actually going for, back and forth on a city bike. Um, and then, unfortunately, at some point, the flower markets closed. So I was, my, my, my wife and uh, one of my kids was home with me, and our house was just, I used every vase and every vessel I could get, and I had flowers everywhere, and I just started shooting them. And then 
I was shooting them in full bloom, which I have uh, one of my one of my uh, sections on my website is the botanicals too. And then as the flowers started to die, um, I just love the how beautiful they became. And uh, I too like shooting sad things. And I'm not really a, a happy, uh, smiley kind of photographer when I shoot people. I love to sort of go onto the more, I guess the subdued side of people. And then the flowers started to sort of die. I'd wake up every day and they were changing on a daily, hourly basis. And then I started to shoot them all uh, in full bloom. And then I started to shoot them right until they, they just basically fell over and died. Yeah. So, yeah. And, no, I, lo I love well, that image of you on a city bike with all these flowers heading home with them to shoot. <laughs> Like, are you sure you can carry these? And I've been city biking in New York forever. So I said, yeah. And I'd even leave some and then go back. So I do two runs and uh, it was amazing. The flower district in New York. I don't know how many people have been fortunate enough to go over there, but it's uh, I developed a relationship with this one flower house and uh, they were amazing. I'd, I'd go and show them little pictures on my phone and they were like, they really kind of thought they were beautiful. And so you know, they gave me a little break here and there on the flowers and they'd let me pick certain ones. And uh, and then I just ended up watching them sort of decay and uh, it just became uh, like sculpture. It was amazing. Yeah, you're talking mm -hmm. about like between 6th and 7th Avenue in the high 20s, low 30s yeah. area. Yeah, yeah, I love that. That's a yeah, beautiful a place. Over there. And, uh, you know, they eventually shut down like the whole city did. And uh, so I was just in my apartment um, shooting flowers for weeks. Uh, and then my wife and I were extended a, a home in upstate or up in Vermont. And we took one of my kids and then I went up to Canada and picked up my other kid and we stayed in Vermont for uh, two, we were gonna be there for two weeks. We stayed for almost two months and I couldn't get any flowers there. So I walked the property and started a whole new body of work called Branches, uh, which was an extension of the botanicals. And, you know, I'm really a person shooter, but I really, uh, Embrace. I used to do a little still life here and there, but can't shoot people during a lockdown. So I just w went to shooting still life and I really, uh, really enjoyed it. it and there's fun. something there's something emblematic of that whole, you know, replacing the person with the dying flower in this type of situation. Well, really, you see very gestural references in this one. Yeah, there's a definitely For example, a like the leaf. To this. I mean, the the way that the the leaf moves in some of these, it reminded me of a flamenco dancer. So I almost feel like you were bringing qualities of people into some of your work during this time. And I actually saw that in several of the artists' um, pieces as I was looking at the show. Yeah, one of our chatters on Twitch is saying that documenting the process of decay is like witnessing transformation, which just seems like a, an appropriate replacement. What about the rest of you out there? What do you, what do you think about this? Um, Hello. 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 Um, I'm usually shooting a lot of happy stuff, but I'm in the middle of uh, what was a terrific fire here in Southern Oregon. And I've been kind of compelled to document everything around. Uh, in the month of December, there was, um, it felt like every day there was a uh, a fog that settled in the valley. I live in the Rogue Valley in Southern Oregon. It's really beautiful. Um, it's where most of the pears come from that people eat in this country. We have pear orchards here as far as the eye can see. And a fire tore right up the creek because uh, blackberry berms have been growing there for 30 years unattended and took out all these communities on either side of the creek. And the woods behind my house are basically just skeletons now. And when this fog came in, I'd look out the windows and have to just throw on my boots and throw on my coat and throw on my hat and gloves and go out and be there in this weird atmospheric condition. The ground is uh, a foot deep of ash so you have to be really careful because sometimes you take a step and your foot disappears into the ground like it would in deep snow huh. oh, wow. um it's crazy 
Um, but I've found beauty in there. It's really odd, but this compulsion I have to take things I see that are beautiful and make them more beautiful um, becomes something else here. And um, part of what I'm doing is to document these woods because all these trees are gonna be coming down really soon. Mm -hmm. And this past week was really strange because all these uh, huge caterpillar excavators, which have been moving closer and closer to my house, um, got to be next door to me. So one of these huge machines came and dredged out people's lives that lived all around me this past week. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm doing in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a level three disaster area, trying to stay sane is make art. And I'm really pleased that um, Josh and David and Taylor saw something in my work and saw uh, a power and a beauty there that um, was worth showing to the world. Yeah, definitely. And you, um, of all of everybody out there, I feel like you were dealt the double blow, right? Because you had the pandemic and then the fires, and it was sort of like two things at once. And I feel like that, you know, has this, I won't say your impact was heavier than everybody else's, but I think you definitely had a lot more uh, to consider in how you made your art with both of these things hitting you at once. Um, I must admit it was a little disconcerting when you're worried about one deadly disaster and um, the air quality is mm. off the charts of yeah. measuring bad air quality. Yeah, I can't, I can't even imagine. Um, so let's see, do we wanna jump? Do you guys, anybody else wanna chime in on this one or we have other questions we can ask? Um, anybody? We can we can we can cruise on to another one. I actually have. Um, well, do you want to do you want to jump in on this one? Or? Well, this one kind of feeds into the last question a little bit. Do you want to um, wait? Or? Well, I mean, I guess we can go ahead and address this one now. It's it's along a similar vein. So even if maybe you were a little too shy and didn't want to say anything, here's your chance. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> one thing that Omar was talking about too, because I keep going back to Omar's bio, um, but he had mentioned that there was a beauty in the abandoned and decay. And again, that goes yes. back towards the isolation and everything. Um, and again, I'm seeing that in all the, the artists' work. Um, I don't know if this is a byproduct of the show as a whole again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if that's something. Well, I feel like it is a byproduct of this show. Yeah. Right. I don't think this was something intentional, but I feel like it's coming out. Yeah. Right. I mean, we can't not talk about, you know, the lockdown, COVID, um, the fires that David experienced. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like this is all a big part of it. Um, you, should we shift gears a little bit? Yeah, let's shift gears a little all bit. All right. I've got I've got a question for all of you that I think is um, I think is 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 uh, an interesting one to tackle. So many of you have backgrounds in film, video, time-based media, um, and even Jim Richards uh, speaks of stories that evolve in time on his website. So time as an aspect of your day-to-day -day work is certainly part of what you do. Yet here we are at a show of photography, the still image, and I'm curious about how you feel about either A, the limitations of that medium, uh, as opposed to what you're used to doing, and do those limitations provo uh, propose or, or create these sort of uh, these, these creative opportunities, or do you find yourself struggling with them, or do you completely separate the two? I, I'm just curious to hear how you work that way. Well, I found it really an opportunity. Um, I work in the film business, and that's how I know David and Josh. Um, and um, I had time to sit and think. And my, my life is normally completely crazy between, you know, living in New York City and, you know, we have a kid and, um, and then, you know, working 15 hours a day um, for, you know, my entire adult life, for as long as I've been making things, it's been a constant stop and start. You know, I get a little bit of a break and I dive into work and I try to, you know, clear my head and remember where I was. 
and sometimes end up in going in a whole different direction. Sometimes I start um, uh, start off where I left. Um, but I had time. I remember sitting. I have a rocking chair in my studio that I never sit in, and I, I sat in my rocking chair and rocked back and forth and looked around. And I ended up making. There was another little body of work that I made that got into a different show um, that came out of me just sitting there and looking around, like just the, having the luxury of time mm -hmm. to think. Oh. Just, I mean, that, and that's, that, I had so much work came out of the pandemic. You were talking about isolation before. I have a show up right now um, that's called Refuge in Isolation. And it was like, cause I, I sort of take refuge in my imagination and um, I had nothing but time to, to, in, in that isolation, to think and make things. And oh, in, 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 the midst of, in the midst of all this, you know, tragedy and sickness and, and death, it was ironic. And I've heard a lot of people say this, um, who make things. It was, it was just, it was wondrous. And I'm, I'm having to go back to work next week for the first time in four months. Yeah. Mm. And, and it's all going to stop, you know, so, um, so that's kind of my response to that. Was, I love that. Very liberating. It was liberating. Yeah, I love that. And I feel like if there's one really great thing that came out of this for a lot of artists, it was that how do you deal with that kind of time? Uh -huh. You know, I had I had so fractured myself across so many different cobbled together things I needed to do to survive. Mm -hmm. And then when they got put on hold or slowed down, I wasn't quite sure how to deal with that vast space. Real quick, um, Mike Rader, who's in our chat, mentioned with David's pieces a minute ago, and I don't want to let this go by, but he says, David piece, David's pieces are so damn peaceful, yet with an eye on a collapse of time in nature, uh, reminds me of many of the Hudson River artists. Yes, Beautiful. very painterly. Yeah. A lot of his work is very painterly, too, if you look at his Instagram. So he's got that eye. Yeah, I didn't yeah. want to, Jim, I didn't want to brush past you on that. I just wanted to make sure that comment got through and thrown in there. But um yeah. But I really, I really appreciate that and how, you know, you know, your, your concept of how time plays a role in, in, in the photography here is, um, is a really, really beautiful one. Um, what do the rest of you think of that, just in terms of how time-based media um, as a place you practice kind of creates a struggle for you or creates an opportunity for you? Um, I mean, I think, you know, I would say I'm primarily a filmmaker, but um, overall, I'm a storyteller, so I'm always looking for ways to tell stories, and I think that's really reflected in my work. It's street photography, um, and it's the stories that I come across or, you know, sometimes even just from seeing objects on the street and what kind of story they told of what, you know, how they got there. Um, and uh, in, these, in these two photos, it's interesting because these are both from 2006, so they're 15 years old, and they're from a trip I took to Guatemala. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting to me to think about how they were chosen, maybe because we're all so stuck at home right now. And, you know, David and Josh were, were thinking about, uh, wanting to go somewhere, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> wanting to travel, but, yeah. uh, but, you know, I think they both, I think, I, I think both these photos are really tell stories. You know, one is a, is a friend I made the one on the, on the, the deck of a boat, uh, of a ferry when we were on our way to um, a resort in uh, Lake Atitlan, and she's got a very wistful look on her face. You know, there's a lot going on in that expression. Um, and the other one is just is uh, two girls in a very small town. Um, you know, I mentioned this in one of the one of the notes that I wrote. It's such a small town that people on the bus were like, you know, I was asking about hotels in this town of Carigua, and people were saying, "Have you have you been to Carigua? <laughs> there there are no hotels." Um, and, uh, and this actually was taken out the window of one, you know, the one hotel, um, of these two girls just riding around the square. And, uh, and I was curious about them and, you know, riding this bike together around this, you know, kind of abandoned looking square. Uh, on one funny point on that, that you mentioned, we tried to look up. Caragua. Yeah, we were trying to solve the mystery of the title. <laughs> And then I was looking at the um, the power lines. I'm like, well, maybe she sees that in some of the power lines. Then we were like looking up the hotels and such. And uh, there's no hotels. There's no hotels. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I found it in a guidebook. Otherwise, I would have had no idea that, uh, you know, that there was. And it wasn't really a hotel. It was somebody's house, you know, that they right. used a hotel. Wow. And 
And and yours kind of, you know, just from the, you're talking about storytelling and, and, and how, you know, I'm thinking about how in these, it feels like time has just slowed but down. Yeah, they're timeless. This woman could be from any era almost, you know, because she even fashionable. <clears throat> um, she's got that nice flash of color, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but it could be at any time. Uh, but also I feel like I'm held back from all of them, you know, like and there's mm -hmm. this, there's this thing going on out there that the speed at which if it is a story unfolding is, is, is almost on pause, mm -hmm. it's slowed way down. Mm -hmm. So yeah, of course it has because it's a photograph, but at the same time, I feel like there's a movement taking place that I'm supposed to be sort of, you know, a part of, mm -hmm. but I can't right. quite be a part of that. So I love that about that. Mm -hmm. um, well, what about the rest of you? Thoughts on that, on, on how time-based media plays a role? Uh, yeah. Hello? Yes, yes, we're here. Hello. Uh, I think I'm agreeing with Betsy 100%. I think it's about what you're seeing in the story and how you need to tell it. Um, a still will tell a story that forces the focus on one image. But, uh, you know, I'm an iPhoneographer. Um, I teach iPhoneography, whether it's shooting stills or video. And the beauty of the device is you can pull it out and um, shoot in whatever fashion the story demands. So stories with movement and stories that are time-based require that I record video, uh, sometimes time-lapse, sometimes with um, crazy apps that change the perception of what you're seeing, um, and still feel the need to shoot photographs of things again i'm going to go back to what betsy said is that it's it's really about what i'm seeing what i want to communicate and what tool in my toolbox can i use to do that most effectively right right yeah no that makes sense um and and on the note of the iphone david i have a question for you at another point as we get a little bit further into this because i'm really curious about that tool in particular and mm -hmm. how your work comes across but i want to save that i want to just see if anybody else okay. wants to comment on this time-based one but sure. that's 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 a that's a good point um any other thoughts on this one um yeah i got something to say around that uh, i'm also a filmmaker and um <clears throat> one of my frustrating moments was um we we're actually out shooting uh a film part of a larger film uh, called Aftermath. And um, so we saw the city at its barest, at its most shut down and loneliest. And um, what was frustrating for me is that I'm actually a character in the film, so I'm not shooting it. And there was a lot of stuff happening around us. Uh, the riots uh, were one of them, a lot of the marches that you know we would encounter on the streets. And I would always, you know, myself, I'd be like, I wish I was shooting this and not necessarily doing this right now. Um, but one afternoon we were out there shooting in Soho and it was pouring. Uh, and then just like it does in the summer, it, you know, it opened up again and it was so bright and beautiful. And one of the marches were, was coming up Broadway. And my director had my still camera for doing uh, some BTS shots. So I'd ran towards the uh, towards the, the the march, and we were actually going to incorporate that in the scene. And I was like, "Oh, I have my phone on me," and there was a guy standing on his motorcycle revving it. And as the as the marches were going by, he had his fist up in the air, smoke everywhere, and I found the puddle that just lined him up perfectly. Squatted down, took my photo, took a couple of shots of it and was able to capture that moment. And that was such an, a great feeling for me. Not only was I out there making a the film while all this was happening, able to see you know, things that you couldn't in isolation. And, mm -hmm. But to capture that moment really like just completed that day uh, for us. And back on the issue of time, uh, my, my production partner and director actually cut that piece, cut a little piece called Time and set it to, uh, Hans Zimmer music for this competition that he entered back in uh, a few months ago. Um, so I don't know, just time is always an essence, you know? Mm -hmm. um, working in production as well and in film, you're privy to a lot of moments. 
be privy to a lot of you know different changes of lights and shadows and um i don't know i just enjoy capturing certain moments that you know otherwise you would miss yeah that moment that moment sounds like a capstone on the whole day right there where you caught that guy in that reflective puddle that's mm -hmm. that's fantastic um i like the way the you know i like omar's reference to being in the film Mm -hmm. being part of the shooting of the film right. and taking the photograph all at once. It's like yes. the, it's like the trifecta. It's yes. all, it's, it's all trendy. there. Yeah. yeah. So I could see how that would build a sort of hyper awareness too, because mm -hmm. if you're in a film that you're also working on making, you're aware of how things are composed. You're, you, you've got to be aware of all of these other aspects. Mm -hmm. If that's unlike, I would imagine if you're just the actor. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I feel like that's, is that right? I mean, am I hitting that a little bit where you kind of have a hyper awareness because of the fact that you're on multiple angles here? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, totally, you know, I've been in production most of my life and uh fan of the movie since I was a child. Uh, I just love art. So I'm, I'm always um, looking for something, you know, of course, and I compare myself to a cyclops sometimes. <laughs> Cool, cool. All right. So, uh, anyone else? Anyone else want to jump in on this? Yeah, I mean, I have a. It, it, it's a little different, but it's just kind of um, the time. Normally, I make documentary films, and I get on these projects that take me a year, two years, three years. And the thing I like about photography is it's a minimal amount of time compared to a film, and so the enjoyment I get out of going out and shooting. I can go shoot something today, get it home, run it through the computer. I think yeah, Jason froze there for a second, sorry. Yeah. Oh, am I back? Yeah, you're yeah. back. You want to okay. just... We yeah, no, just, just with time. Normally, when you do documentary work, the stuff I do, I could be on a project for years. And so photography for me is much smaller amounts of time that I have to spend to get the finished result. And it's it's very rewarding, you know? So I kind of think I enjoy it because I can go shoot something today, put it through the computer and it'll be done by tonight. Whereas you get on a film and you're working on the thing for weeks, months, years. And um, I don't know, there's just something beautiful about photography being so simple compared to film. Yet at the same time, there's no crutches. Your picture is your picture. You get a film, you can have a crutch with sound design, music, cinematography, the acting. You're not that it's such a crutch, but it's different elements add up to the final thing. Whereas in a photograph, that's it. It's one thing. So there's a lot of pressure on it at the same time. But yeah, I think that I love it. That's that's an interesting thought too, because in some ways the photograph is sort of like the naked, raw, exposed sort of singular element, right? But I've seen that happen in filmmaking too, where and this is because I I, you know, I do a little bit of teaching of this, and I've done some myself. And you get home at the end of the day, you're on a shoot, and you don't get everything you need. You're looking through what you have, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, we missed this one moment we probably could have caught. Mm. So there there are, I guess. Um, uh, raw moments where you don't get it in bulk. But I, I love what Mandrake is saying about the the photograph functioning in that more precise, singular, mm -hmm. shorter kind of burst. Interval. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, as from the viewer's standpoint, too, though, you know, uh, taking in a film is very different from taking in a photograph. Yes. And they kind of have, um, I'm going to trip over my words here, but I'm, I'm interested in the differences between those two in how they relate to the making of those two. Yeah. Well, I think they have, you know, some similar qualities, but the, the film usually leads you along a narrative sometimes. Usually. Well, it should. Yeah. Right. Um, the photograph isn't like it, it that. doesn't have it's, to. It's a moment. It doesn't have to. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, all right. So, um, anybody else on this one topic, this, this, this notion well, of time-based media, I had a thought about, um, that whole idea and the word that came to mind, cause I was a filmmaker that who became a still photographer. And one of the reasons that I did it was, um, the immediacy of it, you know, it's like, and, and you can tell, I think you can tell a very profound story with a single image. And I went from, I was shooting super eight, um, experimental movies, a lot of them from still photographs. And then I'm like, well, what I really, what I find really compelling is just that one image. I don't need all this other stuff. And 
So I find it very satisfying and you know immediate and um, can be very profound if you you know you find the right thing. Right. And this kind of goes to the crutch that Mandrake mentioned too in film in that, you know, you've got all this time to sort of work out conveying that message. Mm -hmm. Whereas that crutch doesn't exist in the photo because you've got that one moment. You've mm -hmm. got that one thing. Mm -hmm. um, okay. All right. This was good. I, I, I actually really appreciate this. And, you know, I, um, I, I like to sort of talk about this show from the standpoint of, well, you know, this is the whole show. This is the content that's being conveyed. But I kind of want to get into this process a little bit and get into, you know, people's heads or mm -hmm. the artists' heads and, mm -hmm. and how they work. What do you got for me? You got a question? Well, in getting into the process and how people work, and if he's still here, because I know he had to leave a little bit early. Today, Stefano, is Stefano still here? Stefano, are you still around? Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm gonna stick around until four, actually. Oh, good, oh, good, good, good. good. Okay. All right. So, do you have a question for him? We. Do I'm just trying to find out where it's located here. Is uh, it down here? It might be down here. We might have to scroll. Yeah, at the bottom. Yeah. So I was looking at your work. Very intriguing. Um, and your images seem to cross boundaries of still life and landscapes in a surreal setting. Um, can you talk about the process and how you composed some of those objects yeah. and like how you were experimenting? Cause they were really fascinating to me, <laughs> yeah, especially looking at your other work too, because I know you love to travel and you've got this, these gorgeous, rich, um, like beach uh, scenes yeah. from some of your travels. And I could see some similarities, but could you tell me how you were yeah. setting some of this up? So uh, yeah, I don't really come from a still life background. I'm I'm a photographer myself. I shoot some film, but I, I would consider more myself as a photographer, not not really a filmmaker, mm -hmm. storyteller for sure. I'm more interested in documentary photography and portraiture. So I never really uh, challenged myself too much into still life photography until uh, the lockdown happened and uh, I do happen to live with my girlfriend who's a set designer and prop stylist ah. so, so we're like well we're stuck in here in this room might as well we take advantage of it and we try to do something a bit special about this mm -hmm. and uh, um, so the series of still life that uh, locally uh, Josh Taylor and David uh, choose uh, from my work um they just came out uh, of the, the lockdown first few weeks basically and uh we did shop around a little bit to find a few items that are a bit surreal because we lived in a contest that was a bit surreal so we wanted to tweak the perspective of reality quite a lot and um still talk about topics that were related to the moment um so uh yeah i guess we you know we we just found uh, this sort of like new language into still life. Mm -hmm. I always apply my my color, my 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 treatment. Um, my approach is quite like saturated. Um, I like images that are quite uh, bold, and uh, I don't I, I, I don't I'm, I would say I'm not I'm not really leaning into more happy topics rather than uh dark topics um i just want to put up like maybe uh an idea uh an opinion and just leave space for imagination to an uh, interpretation so yeah i guess uh, the still life work just came out from uh, the collaboration with my girlfriend and um yeah happened to come up to the show eventually <laughs> You know, it's funny, Terry mentions this notion of surreal, and I I can't stop thinking about this notion of Renaissance painting and this idea of the single frame narrative and how you, you kind of compose these in a way that leads the eye in and walks me through a series of symbolic gestures mm -hmm. and, and, and tells a story in a single frame. So do you mm -hmm. have a painting background or does that does that? Well, yeah, I come from a fine art background. Yeah. And uh, I started doing photography while I was finishing my uh, a bachelor degree, basically. And I found the medium uh, uh, much more interesting because of the topic we were discussing earlier. Uh, I didn't log in, but uh, the time uh, aspect and the fact that you can take a photograph and tell a story with it you know, like no uh, such a huge production or like painting uh, something, you know, so it's like something that is there in time and you just go and take it. And uh, I found it very fascinating. Uh, so I guess I pursue that road uh, rather than uh, work on paintings and uh, other forms of art. And uh, yeah, here I am now. It's like 
Gotcha. Gotcha. And I'm glad you're still here to answer those. <laughs> um, all right. So I have a, I have a real quick question for the group actually. Yeah. Um, all right. So on a, on a different topic, and this is going to be, I, I have a bad habit of doing this where I'll ask these questions in these sort of situations where people kind of look at me like, what? Um, so I'm not, I'm, I'm hoping, yeah, I know. I'm hoping <laughs> this comes out in a way that I don't turn it into a complete jumble of words, but here's my question. A number of you in the way that you've presented these photographs, I feel like the photographs um, have an awareness of, this is insane. I'm not even sure I should say this. The photographs seem to have an awareness of themselves as a photograph. And what I mean by that is they, they call attention to the viewer and they call attention to their edge. They call attention mm -hmm. to the fact that this is not just something put on the wall to get lost in. It's a referential thing that... Uh, sort of puts you, the viewer, uh, in consideration yeah. with how it is to be viewed. There's almost a participation factor on behalf of the viewer. Uh, yes. So I, uh, to give an example, and this is, I said to David Scott Leibowitz before that I had a question for him, and this partially goes to that, but the rounded corner. Okay. So to me, the, rounder, the rounded corner is totally indicative of the shape of the iPhone. Like I can't help but think about I just smashed my screen yesterday, by the way, this is really embarrassing. <laughs> um, but I can't help but think how that rounded corner becomes its own portal, becomes referential to the tool and calls attention to the fact that, you know, typically when I look at a photograph, I, I feel compelled to get lost in the space like we do when we see a film, mm -hmm. right? We go into that space. So, you know, there's others like this, like Omar's work with the reflectivity and yes. what axis of actual orientation am I even yes, standing and the in? Portals and Mandrake, the Black's work as well. Yes, exactly. There's this kind of uh, one point perspective portal. And in Betsy's work too, you have the frame of the window and yeah. There's, right, exactly. Yes. And then on top of that, I could even go to Blaze's work where there's this loss of figure ground relationship yes. and it almost becomes objective. So there's there's all these ways in which photography as a as an image to get lost in is defied. Mm. Does this make any sense? And can you guys comment on that at all? <laughs> Silence. I mean, we could jump in from like a curation standpoint. I think that there was a conscious choice to pull in photos that, if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, that did make the viewer think about the fact that it is a still image and that there's a I don't know how you give an inanimate object consciousness, but that that photo is aware of the fact that there's a viewer responding to it. Yeah, there's an inherent problem with me giving an inanimate object consciousness. I, I totally get that. I think, okay, so maybe here's where this question comes from for me. I, I always had a problem, for a long time, I had a problem with video art that was displayed in a gallery in a monitor on a pedestal. And we've seen this before, right? And what we're supposed to do is forget that the monitor and the pedestal exist because they're not supposed to be part of the piece. We're supposed to view the piece, right? So given that we understand that set of rules and we're supposed to go in and just look at what's being shown on the screen, uh, which I have a hard time with, I, then, I, then, I'm, then I guess I'm supposed to apply those same rules to any image that I view. So if a canvas happens to be stretched too thick for a painting, um, you know, I, I want to understand why that does that. I want to understand why that choice was made. So in the case of David Scott Leibowitz's photos, the rounded corner, that was a conscious choice. And I'm curious about how that relates to the work, right? Okay. And I think that's, that's really the basis. All right. Well, I'd love to address that. Um, when I was assembling this collection of images, I was experimenting with the treatment of the edges as you describe. And I stumbled on a whole variety of them. And when I landed on this one, it, I don't know how to describe it other than, than warm and fuzzy. It made that image feel more personal, more accessible. Um, it, it changed the emotional content of all of those images. And I decided en masse that most of the work that I'm creating here in this disaster area really benefits from this very same treatment. And normally I would shy away from that to let a, a series of work be defined 
by an effect um, or a look. Um, and in this case, I found it to be unifying. Mm -hmm. So I decided that um, I would go with it and even actually found a lab that will uh, purposefully cut to the, the strangeness of the curve mm -hmm. on all the work. Yeah, and I think that that unifying, you said warm and fuzzy, or a kind of a, um, um, there's almost an intimacy to it, right? That th there's something about understanding that as a window, understanding that as this kind of uh, calling attention to the edge of the viewable space, mm -hmm. somehow creates that. And that's what I'm curious about. I don't have, the, I don't understand the, the answer necessarily, but I like what David said about that because there is that, and maybe we can't put our finger on it, yeah. but there's something- That's exactly about right. You can't put your finger on it. It wasn't anything that I could say it was black and white. It was just how it felt. Um, right. it, I, I, still, I still can't define it for you. Uh, all I know is how it makes me feel. Okay, mm -hmm. and I and I and I think that's I think that's fantastic. Um, I, and I think that that plays in a number of the other pieces in the show on, yeah. in, in different ways, mm -hmm. right? It's really a curious thing. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it's interesting to think about those notions in a show that is being shown inherently or or mostly online, mm -hmm. and and we're looking at these physicalities to the ways in which they're presented right. through digital means. That's true. So maybe that's a way to maybe that's a connecting point. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on this, you guys? Like Blaze, I'm curious about I'm curious about your figure ground relationships. Um, um, Omar, we we're kind of thinking about that disorientation of that, that, uh, are we up, are we Using down the reflections, the yeah, reflections yeah, as this kind a of certain vertigo to that. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm curious about everybody's uh, reactions to that. Well, I have a thought about, um, about the edges and my, my, um, my reaction when I saw it, cause I didn't notice it. Well, I knew there was something it felt like it softened the entire the image, rounding the image, uh, rounding the edges rather, and um, and there is there is you know as this was mentioned by other people earlier there there is a beauty in the in the the, the desolation and um, you know of the burnt trees. Um, so it was the softening of. Of the presentation of the image that um, that really struck me about uh, David's pieces, and also it made me think of something else when we were talking about edges. There's a um, there's a really amazing photographer named Thomas Joshua Cooper. I Cooper. I don't know if anybody knows about him, but he shoots. He has a, a large format camera. I think it's five by seven, and he goes around and shoots. Um, there's a body work uh, called something extremities and he's basically he shot at all of the edges of the Atlantic basin all over the world and he says this thing that made no sense to me at first until I started to think about it in in, in, compo in choosing his compositions he says all he worries about are the edges the center takes care of itself and I thought that was really interesting. And I've thought about that in, in composing photographs since then. But um, that's what I have to say about that. Jim, I love that. And that is such a real, I, and I think that really gets to the heart of what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. is my questions, a lot of my questions are formed around the edges because the center is telling us what's going on. Right. You know, we know what to do with the center, mm -hmm. right? That's that's perfect. I love that. We wrote his name down. We want to look him up. Yeah. Um, that's great. He's wonderful. Um, okay. I have I have one more group question, and then I don't know how far we want to go before we start turning it over to Q and A. But yeah. Um, well, I think it's a good idea if people do have questions that they should just start typing them so that we can just flow right into them. That's, so we'll that's get a good to point. Them little by little. So if you have questions uh, and you want to type them in the chat, we can read them. If you're in the Zoom side of things uh, on the Brownstone Arts side, um, we'll open it up to Q and A so you can actually uh, speak those questions if you'd like. But mm -hmm. um, like I see one question waiting in the queue, but why don't we just keep going a little bit? Yeah, for those of you yeah. who are asking questions in the various chats, we we're will, gonna get to you. We will get to yeah. you. 
Um, all right, so I have one last question, and that is this, is how do you all view this show in terms of what the other work reveals about your own practice? Did the juxtaposition of the other works offer you anything new in how you see, talk about, make your own work? Um, I often find that if I'm in a group show, I start looking at the other works that were chosen in that show and how those chosen pieces relate to mine or don't and what that tells me. So what are your thoughts on that? Anything? I won't get offended, guys. You can answer honestly. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'd like to just say a little something. I think it's just, um, I think what I take away from all of the work and the show is that you know, you just have to go out and shoot because, you know, if you get bogged down in thinking too much or procrastinating or trying to come up with the perfect image, you can sometimes um, get be your own worst enemy. Like you got to get out of your way. You got to get out of your own way. And uh, I'm just uh, impressed that, you know, I know Betsy, maybe your images are older, but you're probably shooting all the time. And I just think it's important you know, to get out, like, I didn't know what I was going to do during the lockdown. It just sort of came to me. And, uh, you know, David, you know, you just looked out your window and it was right there in front of you. And then Stefano, you know, you, everybody seemed to be quite resourceful in just sort of coming up with something to do and not second guess. I just tried not to second guess myself. I just started shooting and I just sort of was like, if this is great, then great. But if it's not, I'm just going to keep shooting anyway, you know, and uh, I just sort of got out of my own way in the lockdown and just let it, let it sort of go, you know, and uh, I wasn't so worried about how great or how bad the photographs were. I was just more concerned about at least producing something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, Stefano. Sorry. Oh yeah. No, I totally agree with what he's saying is it's just, be, put yourself out there and also like don't think too much about limits I mean I come from a, a background that is like in Europe we do overthink things a lot and I'm sure here in America you're aware of that so I really appreciate the way America approaches to art in general is much more loose and uh, most of the time you just put yourself out there you 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 know you cross your boundaries your limits and uh, it's not to make something great and necessarily it's just to do something and uh, eventually it, it, you start off somewhere and you end up somewhere else and maybe you didn't think you will get there but it's that's that's the work the truth work at the end of the day uh, that doesn't happen if you're just thinking about it sitting in the sofa and waiting for things to happen to you so I totally agree with what Basley was saying is just like just put yourself out there and do it I, I love also, oh. go ahead go ahead I'm sorry I was just going to say it is also something beautiful about the process, uh, about the self-discovery. Uh, and the more you push yourself, the, the more uh, open you are to possibilities. So I just wanted to add that to it. I totally agree with that. Yeah. I, I, and all three of these are right on the mark just in terms of, you know, one, one thing I'm a huge advocate of and I teach from a standpoint of is the making is the thinking often. Mm -hmm. In that if you are sitting around, as Stefano just said, just thinking about it, you're not really doing anything. This is true. Yes. Right. But if you're if you're engaged in the process and getting out of your own way, as Blaze was saying, and really just moving forward, mm -hmm. the 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 process itself becomes the thought. Correct. Which I'm which is one of my favorite places to sort of teach from. Yeah. So I love I love hearing I love hearing that. And I think this show definitely re reflects that mm -hmm. on some level. Like I especially as we dug into the artists a little oh, bit deeper goodness, and saw yeah. the process and where these pieces line up with that. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else on this one? Anybody else? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, for me, the beauty is seeing uh, work of mature artists. Uh, series is always great because then you get a, a vision and a depth. Um, it's also been great because now you can pay closer attention to people's work on Instagram. Uh, I've always been a fan of Betsy's and Jim's, but I've obviously become a real big fan of Omar's recently, just getting to see more of your work. Um, I do appreciate uh, the spontaneity of some of the work of some of the artists that's, that's come forth here. Uh, I need to do more of that. Um, it was, um, 
you know, it's enlightening to see people's uh, passion spelled out in a couple of frames. You know, you get to really see people. Um, great experience. Thank you. Good. 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 Um, should we? Open? I, I, I have oh. a quick thing to say. Just, um, you know, I agree with everything that's been said about this so far. But I think, and I think this is probably true of everybody. The reason that we make these images is because we have to. Like I, I, I just, I have to take pictures because. I, I just see all this stuff, and so, so I make images when, when I see something that's a you know a photograph, or that's that you know that that strikes me, makes me feel something. Hmm. So, yeah, there's a power in that. That is that is also really I hear that all the time. I feel that way myself. Uh -huh. I love that, um, and I think it's also a way of making sense of of what's going on around you. Um, uh, because you can see it in a, it, you, I just see things in an entirely new way when I'm looking at them through the frame. Um, yeah. And you, also, you also become privy of the changes that are happening around you. Hmm. Yeah, and I think making sense of this time, especially, I mean, not that we weren't trying to do that with the world before. Right. But uh, I like that's, you know, making sense of the world around you now more than ever. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. So let's Q and A a little bit. You want to? Yeah, we can. Q Actually, it. can I can I just add one thing to the last oh, sentence? Absolutely. It's like, I do I do think it's like we live in a in a, in a time that is very hard to be relevant with photography. Like so, it's 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 a moment in time where it's like everyone you know could take pictures, and we have just a, such a like high consumption of like images and scrolling mentality that is like super super hard i think to uh, tell a story with images that is actually relevant to someone like the, the attention that people pay to to images in general is much lower so yeah i was like just wanted to point this too because it's like the, the all the images in the shows that do make a point within a few images and that's quite amazing to me like we would do live like you know in a, in a time where we see a lot of pictures and there's no point most of the time that like, and no i just just wanted to say that. Yeah. I love that you said that, Stefano. <laughs> this notion that the pressure involved in just getting someone to look at what you're doing, given the attention spans, given the speed at which images come at us, mm -hmm. is God, I mean, it's it's so hard. It is. Yeah. So I, I, I like that. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you deal with that? You know, there's this idea that every I mean, when you and David, this is not necessarily to uh, negate or dilute what you do with the iPhone. But when the iPhone says that everyone's a photographer, and then we've got people that have been working in photography for a long time, like that's got to be hard to sort of wrap your head around where everyone out there, you know, is shooting these these images. And I mean, those these, a lot of these phones now are making it making people able to shoot beautiful images. And how do photographers deal with that or wrap? Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's actually great that everybody can actually be in the place and tell a story. And, you know, we're much more accessible to information than what it used to be. It's just for us, it's much harder to be filtering all the information that we get and just to try to be conscious about what we see and make a choice and say, oh, this is kind of like interesting to me or not. I think technology is going to just keep growing, getting better, and we can't deal with it. We cannot just be sitting and say, oh, it was better before. I mean, I still Correct. should film myself. I don't use digital cameras, but doesn't mean like I, I'm against somebody shoots an iPhone. It's like, to me, it's like the story that, that matters at the end of the day. So I'm very grateful that actually we have access to, you know, technology this way. It's yeah. Yeah, I agree. David, what do you think? You started to say something there. Well, Obviously, I'm a prejudiced opinion. I mean, I've been pretty much involved with the iPhoneography movement since they opened the App Store in 2008. And that's when I stopped shooting with a regular camera. Um, I'm going to say that there are innumerable photographers who leave their camera bags at home now because they can pull out their phone and shoot a 30 megabyte TIFF file or RAW with their phone or shoot 4K video. Um, and 
I mean, I, I have to tell you how great it is as somebody who's been lugging a, a 30 pound camera bag around my whole life to, to be free of that. Um, the iPhoneography movement, and I'm going to call it a movement because there are still many people who don't really see it as, as legitimate, is um, where I'm finding all the excitement in the photographic world. And again, I'm, I'm a prejudiced opinion about that, but um, there's spectacular work being done with no phones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So I'm going to, I'm going to, that's, that's enough said. I don't want to, you know, proselytize uh, what I teach and the book I've written and all of those things. It's better left to others. Okay. That's fair. That's mm -hmm. fair. And I think I, I agree a hundred percent. I feel like, I, I feel like it's a gift on some level to have all these images coming at us. It's just something that we have to learn how to adjust to. Yes. I, I must say one last thing. Um, how satisfying it is for me to be uh, included in a photo show that doesn't have the word iPhoneography or mobile art or any relationship to the device I'm using to make my art. Um, all the exhibitions I've been involved in in the past 15 years have been related to the medium of, of iPhoneography and mobile art. And this felt really interesting to just have somebody say, no, it, it's a group photo show and there's no mention of phones anywhere. And I, I think that's terrific. Um, yeah. I'm really pleased with that part of it. I would just also say as a street photographer that it is, you know, it, it is kind of amazing to have a, a really good camera on you all the time. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, whatever is happening, you're, you're, you're there for, you know, if I, I take a lot of pictures when I'm at work or when I'm on a break or, you know, and it's fantastic that I have that in my pocket um, because that's, you know, that's where you're going to find some of your great observations, not having to, you know, not having to, to premeditate it so much. Right. Exactly. Right. I'm sorry, Betsy, can I just, or for all the street photographers, I'm curious, do you find that the iPhone sort of uh, removes a barrier between you and the subject because of how people, how comfortable people are with phones in their everyday life? I guess compared to when you used to use a real film camera and have to bring it up to shoot people? I uh, I still walk around with my uh, regular camera. I don't want to get too used to the phone. Uh, but yeah, I get stopped a lot when, or people get really intimidated when they see, you know, the Canon as opposed to everybody. You could, you could pretend you're texting and take a photo with your phone. Uh, you know? Well, I say that because I hate having my picture taken and I know that people at work have gotten good candidates of me because they've used their phone and I'm not aware of it happening. <laughs> I also also try to keep a distance between me and my subject. You know, I don't get in people's faces. You know, I'm not that person. I like the the silhouette. You know, in the background. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I definitely have been able to take certain photos that I wouldn't have been able to take if I was taking them with a big with a big camera. But that brings up its own issues. You know, because if you're taking a surreptitious photo, um, you know, what does that what does that do to the to your subjects and um, is that fair and and so on? So that that brings up a whole other can of worms. Mm. Josh, what you are describing um, was something that actually happened with Google Glass. I was uh, mm -hmm. one of the um, stupid people who actually bought that product uh, <laughs> uh, in 2004 and wore it around. But uh, it was the first time. You didn't have a camera, you didn't have a phone, you didn't have a device between yourself and the subject. And you could just engage them and you could have eye contact with them and be recording video, taking stills. And it literally did make that whole wall disappear. That's the only thing, the only device in my lifetime that I've shot with where that just went away completely. And you won't see it again until it's common practice for you to wear a pair of glasses and you just blink at a certain speed and it takes a photograph the way Google Glass did. Interesting, thank you. Or for those of you who watch Black Mirror, you could have the chip implanted in the back of your head that records every <laughs> single thing you see. But that's another story. Yeah. I'm online for that. Yeah, that could be, I bet you'd like that, David. That would be good. I would. 
<laughs> so should we, uh, can we offer up a little q and yeah, I think it's a good time a for that. Q&A. Um so for those of you who are out there either on the Zoom call or on the Twitch channel, if you have questions, we have a few floating around in our uh, in our chat. So we can start off with that um, and go from there. Do you want to read? Uh, Carolyn yeah, has a question. Carolyn has a question. I keep hearing the common theme, darkness. I photograph dark images. To all the dark photographers, was this a conscious decision? For I see that there is such beauty. Um, I think she's, yeah, and then she edited herself and she says, I see beauty, not darkness. So she's seeing beauty, but we're talking about darkness. So she's yeah. curious about the delineation, I think, between those two worlds. But I'm just going to have to leave soon, guys, but I might join you within 30 minutes or something if I can. Okay. Since I'm not a dark photographer, I guess this doesn't relate to me. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take a moment to go. Well, Stefano, and go. We'll see you later. Thank, thank you very much, much. and we'll, yeah. we'll see you thank in a little you, thank while. Thank you. I tried to make this quick so I can come back. Okay. Excellent. No Thanks. Problem. Bye. I have to just say a little something about that. Like my images in this show are not dark, mm. but for me, it's just about the light and whether the light is dark, or whether the light is bright. It just you know, light lends itself to the image. And whenever I think about taking an image, it's always based on what the quality of the light is. And then that sort of defines what the image is. Mm. So, you know, that's, I, I just would say about the darkness, because I shoot dark images and I shoot bright images, mostly dark on the darker side, but it's always just about the light, you know? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. I, I think we kind of got off on maybe a tangent with the whole darkness thing because of, you know, this, this yeah. we're trying to find some underlying uh, theme. Yeah. But Same. no, I think that's, I think that's a good way of putting mm -hmm. it. Um, there is one question in our chat that is kind of fun. <laughs> Somebody in our chat would like to know what Jim is sewing right Jim now. Jim the maker. <laughs> <He's> sewing. <laughs> Jim makes things compulsively and Jim works compulsively. So um, I'm, I'm sewing something that I've been meaning to sew for a really long time, but nobody but you guys have been able to get me to sit down and have time to actually do this and not work on um, my myriad other projects. So I'm sewing a sh my favorite old black shirt together that it ripped and was just hopeless. Oh. It was embarrassing to wear. <laughs> and it's done. Oh, oh good. There you go. So we afforded you the time to do that. Thank you so much. Okay. I got to go now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay. Uh, what about those of you out there in the Zoom? Um, do you have questions you'd like to ask of our artists? You can uh, jump right in if you want to and ask, um, or you can put them in the chat. I have a comment about darkness. Oh. Because mm -hmm. while my photographs in this show are not particularly dark, they are using um, infrared uh, light. Mm -hmm. But I most of the work that I make is really, really dark. And I just find it beautiful and, and profound and magical. Mm -hmm. So that's what I have to say about that. OK. And, and I, liked, um, um, I liked that notion of wonderment and magic. I think that you had mentioned earlier, or I read somewhere. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's two. Really my artist is that's for my bio. That's I mean that's just what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. I don't I I don't live in the real world. I live in like a little fantasy land somewhere. Well, Jim, I got to tell you, when I came across those little tins with the razor blades that had oh the emulsion on them, I gasped. Yes. I was like, Fantastic. And it, the fact that you call yourself Maker Jim and and that you you kind of associate yourself with the, with that practice of making uh -huh. uh, resonated very profoundly with me. And so I really took time and looked through your website, and I and I really enjoyed some of those pieces immensely. So I got to I got to tell you that. I thank you very much. Um, all right. So what other questions do we have? Anybody in Zoom land want to want to ask a question? Mm. Um, I have a question. Oh, there we go. Hi, my name's Kevin. And, uh, hey, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. How are you doing? Hey, David. How you doing? Jim, I, re I, re I recognize you, Jim, from my okay. days and on, on set. And David, okay. I've known for a long time on set. And this is actually somewhat related to this idea of um, time-based media and, and the photograph. Um, I 
you know, I used to go around with a camera and now I, I have my phone, so I don't carry a camera. Um, carrying a phone kind of has me looking all the time now more than I used to, or more noting when I see. Um, I'm struggling with it with a with a with a concept that um, that I can't find the answer to, and and it's I don't know if there is one, but I'll throw it out there. Um, essentially, our eyes have the ability to see in wide angle and close up simultaneously so that we can essentially be in nature, see the forest, and then at the same time see the cardinal on the branch, you know, 50, well, whatever, 15 yards away, 20 yards away. So when it's time to take the photo, do I zoom into the cardinal or do I shoot the wide shot and hope that somebody sees the cardinal that I see? Mm -hmm. um, Neither of those are satisfactory in replicating my experience because my experience is that I can do both at the same time. Uh, now, as a cameraman, there are other ways to achieve that. And part of it was, as we were talking earlier about crutches. So um, I can shoot the wide shot with the cardinal. And if I just hear the cardinal's song, I will see the cardinal and know that that's what the subject is. But until I hear the song, it's again, I'm, I'm, I'm lost making a subjective choice as a viewer mm. uh, as to what the focus is. Um, having put all that out there, how do, um, how do you each um, deal with that uh, question of the object versus the context? And in many ways, uh, if you look at Eggleston's work, there is no object. It's all it's all color and composition. But then you look at someone else's work, uh, uh, for one of the, uh, Robert Frank, and it's it's about subject, you know. But the context is still there. So um, now that we're all walking around with phones that can zoom in, but not very well not as well as you would like. So, you know, you can say, oh, put on a longer lens or stick with your wide angle or always run around with a zoom. Um, neither of those kind of complete the, the, the thought that, that perplexes me when I shoot. Hmm. Okay, what do you guys think? Well, I wanna tell you about an application for your phone um, called <laughs> Dual Cam which allows you to simultaneously choose between the three forward lenses and the one back lens to select two of those views and record them as separate 1080 files simultaneously in your camera. Hmm. It will also allow you to record it as a picture in picture. So that if there's a scene you are shooting and you want yourself from that back camera in the corner um, narrating, um, you can do that too. Check it out, it might solve a dilemma. When I'm shooting animals and running, I'll use it because I want the close up, but it's hard when you're running with an animal to keep them framed up. So I will shoot wide and telephoto simultaneously. Mm -hmm. What's it called again? Okay. Uh, dual cam. Cool. Thanks. I think that's an interesting question. Like, you know, I, I, and, and I love David's response in that there's an app for that, you know, we can, we can <laughs> do that. Uh -huh. But there's also this idea, there's this idea that that was a dilemma before we had that technology. It was. Right. Uh -huh. And so, you know, because we could not dual cam, mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I don't know what I would have done in that situation. And Ke it's Kevin, right? That asked the question. Yeah. Kevin, I Kevin, it's called double take. I'm, I'm going to take that back. The name of the app is double take all one uh, word. Okay. I guess I have to move beyond an iPhone six now. I'm sorry. <laughs> Kevin. I hate to do that. Well, I hate to do that to you. <laughs> well, I have a couple things to say about it. Um, one is that I, I I actually have an image in this show that was um, I found it 
using my peripheral vision. I was in Ireland, that's where all these pictures are from. And I was driving, I was there with my wife. And of course I would stop every four inches and take a photograph. And I saw this weird thing out of the corner of my eye. And I was like, I can't make her, I can't make her sit through this again and stop and wait. And so we drove on and we drove for like a couple of miles and I was like, I have to go back. And so the image tractor um, that has the amazing tree in it is because I just, could, I said, well, I saw it out of the corner of my eye peripherally. And um, it's one of my favorite images. Just that tree just kind of blows my mind. And um, so yeah. there, so that, that's, that's sort of a, um, I don't know, a vote in direction of, of wide and peripheral in a way of, a way of seeing but also I, I found now I, I edit my images more. And if you take it a little bit wider, then you can, you can always crop it and make a, a better composition. Um, and maybe get something that you weren't thinking about initially when you make the image. Mm. So, I, and, and that's somebody who, who like doesn't own a macro lens and would love to take pictures of the tiniest, tiniest little things. Yeah. Um, that's what I've been finding is if I'm not sure, I always go a little bit wider and then I can always crop it. I appreciate that, Jim. You know, when, 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 uh, producers or directors would tell me to widen out because we can always blow it up in post when I was shooting <laughs> commercials, um, uh, it was so against my desire to create the image as I saw it that, um, I have to push myself to do that. Yeah. Well, but the other thing is that, you know, I, I found that when I'm making an image, I just, I think you should trust yourself and you should make the image that you think is right. And, and, you know, as a cinematographer, that's what they hire you for. They yeah. want your, they want your perspective. So, oh. so I think you always need to trust yourself and make the image that you think. You're, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I like, I, I, I love that notion of trusting yourself. Yeah. Um, did, was there a question that, uh, was there a, uh, Kevin, did we get an answer to that? Did anybody else want to comment on Kevin's question? Okay, I, I was curious, was there another question that popped up in Zoom? I wasn't sure if somebody was also trying to ask a question over there. I thought I heard somebody say something. Even in Twitch, actually. Yes, there is one in Twitch coming up. Uh, I just wasn't sure, I didn't want to override somebody in Zoom. So it's, I'm trying to get everybody. So there's one in here that from Ben Hagenbush who says, has anyone in here ever taken a photo of a painting? Hope this is not a dumb question. Any pointers anyone can give me open to anything new? Um, well, that's interesting, a technical question. <laughs> good. Um, Artsy actually has a really good guide for how to photograph paintings if you're interested. It's on their website. Oh, on Artsy, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so Ben. Um, somebody might have better firsthand knowledge, but for somebody that had to learn to do this for a digital gallery, Arts is a great resource. Yeah, Ben. I was going to say maybe Josh would be your uh, be one of your go tos on this one. I'm sure he's has to do he's had to do that. Um, all right. So, uh, any thoughts on that? Anybody else? Or well, when you're photographing a, a photograph or a, or a painting, I find you know I'm a lighting guy, so um, you have to usually black out what's behind you. Um, so it sort of becomes it becomes a, a lighting issue for, you know, in my perspective to get rid of glares and stuff like that. Um, so that's generally what I do when I, you know, I, I stand there and I look at whatever it is I'm photographing. Rephotographing photographs is particularly dif uh, difficult because of the reflectance issues. But then, you know, what you normally want to do is just black out behind and then and introduce some kind of top light or side lights, so you're not going to have reflection. Mm. Great, mm. great, cool. Thank you yeah. for that. Um, anyone else? Thoughts, questions on the work? Questions for the artists? I have one I can throw in that's uh, a little tongue in cheek that I've been trying to ask, but I figured I'd wait until I everyone. Think, I think I know which question that you is. You know what I'm going to ask? I think so. I have a question for Mandrake the Black. Mandrake, are you still here? Are you still with us? Yeah, oh, I, I have a question for you that I feel like I have to ask. Um, we went deep on your stuff. Yeah, we, we went. <laughs> <laughs> what, 
What was it like working with David Lynch? I gotta ask you. I know that's not part of the show, but I just I'm dying to know. I, I got it. Can I know? Can I know? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a ride. <laughs> I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah, I'll bet. It's a ride, man. I mean, he's he gets as weird as you think he would, but then he more normal than any of us. So it's kind of like you're riding that ride, but it's um, it was great. I mean. I did the Twin Peaks thing and was on him three feet away from him for eight months, you know, filming. And um, it's fun. He's great. His crew loves him. And uh, he's really, he's inspiring to watch, especially with the actors. And that was kind of my big thing because I had such proximity to him. You know, you got to sit in on all the, the actor, the kind of the prep and um, the rehearsals. And that's where you really get to see somebody work. And um, yeah, it's great, but it's definitely a ride. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you for that. I'm sure it's a ride, man. That's got to be awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Anybody else on the Q&A? Maybe we're winding down here, David. What do you think? Maybe so. No one's. Look, I have a question for I have a question for Mandrick the Black. So, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Tell us uh, how, why why where did Mandrick the Black come from? Oh man, I have like ten different aliases. I'm all over the I'm all over the world doing all kinds of crazy stuff, techno stuff, filmmaking, photography. I'm just a weirdo. And I, I don't like to do projects under the same name. So I spread it out all many years now for probably. Wow. I love years. that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's a, a good thing yeah. with the artists asking each other yeah. the question because that's, that's true. Covered. And I think that's well, a great thing that. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to know what is everybody using gear wise? I know that David <laughs> in the iPhone. <laughs> what are you guys using? Mm. Uh, I use Canon 5D Mark IVs, uh, and unfortunately, oh. I don't use them for video. They're a little limiting, but um, I've got some videos on my site. I've been shooting some short movies, and uh, I've actually just because I don't own, I don't have the, I don't have a, a better video camera now, so I've been shooting all my video with the Canon and. Uh, it's challenging, but I always say to young photographers, use whatever tool you got in your toolbox. Mm. Yeah, and what's that camera you got sitting behind you? Is that your can? Is that the Mark Mark IV? That's Mark IV. I have two of them, you know, because I was I was real like I'm a commercial photographer. So when you go on set, you guys know you got to have two of everything. So I've got two bodies, and I use them. It's nice to have two because you can set up a long shot and a short shot when you're doing video, or a tight shot and a, a wide shot. So that's what I've been using. And, you know, they are limiting for video. Um, and I, and then for stills, I'd, I'd really like to get a, a digital back, a big, big one. But it's just, you know, I don't know how many people have been making a ton of money over the last year, but I haven't. And uh, you just, uh, you know, when the money comes in, I always sort of try and put a little money towards my gear. But for now, I'm just using Canon Mark uh, 5D Mark IVs. And I've got a whole bunch of different lenses, beautiful fixed focus glass. I've got the 85 1.2, the 50 1.2. But I shoot all of my pictures on this show with a little macro Canon because I didn't have an assistant. So I was able to sit behind the tripod. And I was actually able to reach my hand around and manipulate the things that I was photographing uh, without sort of almost getting out from behind the camera, which was really handy. Hmm. How did you light those flowers? Were you using, you know, continuous strobes? What were you using? Just the all backlit. Um, I put a I put a scrim against the window, and yeah. then I bounced light in. There's no strobe at all. It's all shot with negative fill and and uh, bounce oh wow, man that's cool. fantastic mm. uh, i tried yeah, to keep it simple yeah i'm envious of that 51.2 the best i could afford was the 1.4 but uh that's a beautiful lens and and i just on a little off thing all my dusk imagery is shot 
with my 85 and my 50, and they're all shot at 1.2. Very mm -hmm. difficult to get your focal focus yeah. right, but it yeah. gives it that cinematic quality that you can't replicate. And as soon as you take the lens and you go to 1.4 or 1.8, the whole image changes. So it's one, two or nothing for me on the dusk imagery. And um, without those lenses, that body of work wouldn't really be what it is. So that's gorgeous. That's it, but, you know, you know, you got to spend the money sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's... yeah. What are you guys using the other gear that you guys or the other cameras you all are using? Well, I'm a Canon guy also. I have a, but it's not really nice. I, I sort of, I, I put um, limitations on my gear and then I just have to deal with it. What do you I, mean, limitations? Well, well, like as opposed to spending a huge, like I, I bought a mediocre camera. It's a Canon Rebel T2i. That's but I got a nice lens. I got the L, the L series Canon 70 to 200. And that's what I shoot with on that. That's, I have one, I have one lens. Um, and, then, and then my iPhone and that's it. What yeah, I did do though was I, and this this is relevant to the images in the show. Initially, I did a an infrared conversion to the camera, and so that so I committed to that. So I said I'm just going to shoot infrared, and then I had problems with that over time, with like these dots that would show up on all my images, and nobody could clean them off. So I did a a, a reconversion into full spectrum conversion, and that's interesting to me because now my camera is not limited to infrared I can do infrared um, or regular visible light or um, ultraviolet with filters and so and then but it's just that camera and one lens and that's it or my iPhone that's very cool I tell my students all the time when they come to me and they say so oh, I want to buy a camera what should I do and I'm like put your money in the lens you know, and a T2i is a great camera body if you're going to buy a great lens to go with it. So for sure, that's a great idea. Anyone else on that one? I love that question. I like talking gear. <laughs> I actually, I actually use um, four different iPhones because uh, one of the problems is that really great applications um, do not get redeveloped when they upgrade a phone or an iOS. And that functionality, whatever that functionality is, disappears off the face of the earth. Mm. Unless you have a, a, a seven-year-old iPhone still plugged in, still working, that requires a battery plugged into it at all times, even to function when you're shooting with it. But I, I do that because there's a $2 app in there that I don't want to go away. So even though I'm only using a phone, I, I, I carry many of them when I shoot. Cool. Um, I, when I switched over, I used to have, you know, this Canon AL, AL1, which came out before the AE1. That's what this was taken with, with these photos were taken with on film. And I also had a Holga. Um, but when I switched to digital, um, I got a 30D and that's sort of my, that's my big camera now, but I really like using the iPhone. Honestly, I use it. I mean, I, I really only take the 30D with me on vacation and specific, you know, photography trips and stuff like that. Um, and I have, yeah, I have apps on that, you know, like I love camera plus is my favorite manipulating app. I mean, I usually just use the iPhone, the regular camera, because I like the features of that camera. Um, as an app for video, I use, I use something different, but, um, but for stills, I like the, I like the iPhone camera app, but I use uh, camera plus in, in, you know, their, their like darkroom functions for uh, for manipulating they have some they have a great clarity filter that i really just think is fantastic hmm. cool cool what about the rest of you got questions for each other any other thoughts for each other i had just one one other comment and this was something when i because i was a real hardcore film guy and never shot large format it was always 35 but you know i had a dark room i still have a dark room and, and a larger and then when I switched over to digital, I'm like, well, what do I do with this? Because I was, for many, many years, I printed um, images with liquid emulsion on all kinds of media, like, you know, wood and copper and glass and stuff. And the razor blades that you mentioned um, earlier, Todd. Mm -hmm. But um, I, a, a, another photographer turned me on to this stuff called Picturico. So th for those of us who are older, 
if you remember um, overhead transparency from school, we used to have, you know, we used to have, uh, you know, these clear transparency images that they, they could be printed, I think on, you know, some kind of regular printer and then they would be projected with this projector. Well, this stuff called Picturica, which you can get at B&H or any good photo place, um, I have a pretty, pretty nice inkjet printer and you can make digital negatives from your, um, from your images and, you know, in, invert them and then have a negative and then do contact prints. Oh, wow. Um, in a conventional dark room. And that, that actually eliminates the need for, um, uh, for an enlarger, which I gave away to a young aspiring photographer who is a hardcore 35 only guy. Um, because you just, you just print on Picturico for the size of whatever your, you know, your medium is, you know, if you're printing, you know, eight and a half by 11 or, um, you know, 13 by 19 or whatever it is, you can buy Picturico in that size and then print and then, and then you just turn the lights on and, and then you, know, you can, you can, then now you, now you're in analog mode and you take your, um, your photo paper and you put it in trays and, and process it with, uh, you know, with developer and fixer and all that stuff. And you can, that's a way, of, it's a way of bridging the, the gap between digital and, um, and analog. I like that really unlikely kind of pairing of the digital over to the analog, you know, that kind of crossover that I wouldn't expect to do. That's kind of, that's really cool. Well, some of these images that are in the show are, have been printed on wood and copper. And that's how I did it with, with, uh, uh, making a digital negative with Victor Eco. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wow. I think, cool. I think we just lost David and Taylor and Josh, which means if they're not here, are they still here? Did they go? Well, the parents are out. We can have a party now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll pop back in. What about the rest of you? Any other questions for each other, the artists in the show? Um, any other thoughts? Or um... I have a question for Omar because I was looking at um... Omar. Are you still here? Yeah. So I think it it mentioned <clears throat> that your images are printed on. Is it bamboo paper? Yeah. So for the most part, yeah. I I I make paper also. So um, do you make it or do you buy it? And how do you, how do you how do you make the prints? No, my print is sent out. Uh, I use a Bay Photo uh, printing lab, uh -huh. uh, and I, I like the way uh, the bamboo uh, brings the uh, the textures and colors from the from the photos. Oh, yeah. uh, but I printed on metal too uh, recently. Uh, the motorcycle photo that I, I was describing, and that came out pretty well too. And that was through the lab as well. Yeah, through the lab. I don't have the space or the equipment to do my own printing. Yeah. I used to have uh, the enlarger and do my own black and whites back in the day, but uh, I haven't done that in a while. They're back. We're back. Sorry, sorry. sorry to ruin the fun, guys. We were just about okay. to have a party. Were you talking about us? <laughs> yes. Yes, we were. <laughs> so I also want to uh, recommend Bay Photo um, as a really great source. Uh, Where are they? they also the lab they're in san francisco okay or in the bay area um and they are also the ones that will cut a very personalized shape um out of metal if you're printing on metal mm. so the corners of my images they're not real rounded corners they kind of got their own shape uh they'll cut those mm. good resource bay photo nice so that, is that who did your um your dye sublimation, David? Uh, no, I do my own dye sublimation. Can you tell me? Can you tell us anything about that? Because that sounds interesting. Well, it's a, a separate printer, um, and I've just moved from uh, Sawgrass, and I'm waiting for a new Epson dye sub. Um, and you're printing uh, the inverse of your images, lift, and then. Um, printing them onto metal or ceramic or fabric or um, all kinds of um, silly things like, you know, baseball hats and coffee mugs and stuff like that. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I like being able to 
uh, tangibly create these things. And the die sub, just the nature of the technology is that it's really vibrant. What printer so, do you use? What printer is it? Uh, it hasn't arrived yet. I think it's the Epson 710. But I, I'll, I'll check and email you if it's different. And what it's, kind of metal do you use? Uh, I use blanks, um, of different what, shapes. What kind? What's it's aluminum. Metal? Okay. It's aluminum, and it it, ha it's, it has to be coated um, with the material to accept the sublimation. What do you and use? Heat press. Heat press. You need a. You need a yeah. I mean, you need a. a it's a device that um, it's clamp shape. Uh, you control temperature, time, and pressure are your three variables. So depending on the medium that you're printing on uh, requires different settings. And you can find that online in a lot of trial and error. And um, I find the results to be spectacular. What's the light sensitive uh, material? You know, like the what's, what makes the emulsion? Or, you know, what's the um, image? It's it's actually the printer itself deposits like a gel okay. onto the paper, um, and then the heat transfers the gel and the dyes into the coated materials. Got it. And so it comes from it comes from the printer. Yes, and I mean it's like you know you can use them as trivets. I mean they're really they're pretty indestructible, pretty great. Trivets. The metal is washable. It's um, it's cool. Yeah, that's really, they, they are really beautiful. Thank you. I would love, I think one of the things I miss in this is being yeah. able to tangibly like pick these works up or look at them or see them yeah, physically. in person. Yeah, Omar's yeah. talking about the bamboo paper and the textures. Oh yeah, yeah, Very I, yeah. fiber, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Any, any, any final thoughts? Y'all know each other's work at this point. Is there any... Anything else anybody would like to add before we wrap up for the day? Anybody? I, I loved everybody's work. I was really um, blown <laughs> away by the diversity and um, you know the skill and the creativity and how beautiful everything was. And you know, so much thanks to uh, David and Josh for um, curating the show, for putting it all together. And um, that's all. Okay. Yes, yeah, same here. Yeah. Big shout out. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate okay. the inclusion yeah. and great. Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you to you guys. This was a great way to, uh, you know, end the closing of the show just to precede the closing of the show, which is tomorrow. Um, and um, yeah, this was wonderful. So thank you for joining us today. It was thank good. you. Uh, thank you. I just want to thank um, Todd and Terry for a great job moderating. And uh, I think, yeah, shout out to them for sure. Right. And a shout out to you, Jim, or David. Thank you. We really appreciate having us on and Josh and Taylor and all the work you guys have done to help us out with this and make this, we, this is new. So we, yeah. we feel like this was uh, a really new and interesting way of dealing with this shutdown and, and trying to get work out there to people, which we, we yeah. really enjoy doing. So thank you for that. It's very um, satisfying. But, and I also just want to say in case everybody that's still with us on the show and all the artists that they should check out your show on Tuesday nights on Twitch TV, The Large Glass. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I mean, I'm hooked. <laughs> we, love, we love having you. We love, we love having that you. you're hooked. Yeah, we love that you're hooked. I love the name The Large Glass. I think that's yeah. really terrific. Thank you. You guys should definitely things. join them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So if you can, you know, follow us, come watch on Tuesday nights, you know, with what we've learned from all of you, the artists in the show, we'd love to do a show. Yeah, on, we'd love to feature some of you on uh, our show and, 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 you know, spread that out somehow and, and, and kind of include everybody, but yeah, yeah for sure. So thank you for that. Okay. But, um, all right. Well, I we, think Todd needs a near refill on his wine glass. So you, you noticed that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Hey, I'm going to go fill that up and we're going to, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll try and get out on the deck a little bit and see if 51 degrees is enough to tolerate. Ooh. And if anyone is out there still uh, that hasn't seen the show, 
or wants to see it now, it's still up, even though the show is closing and we're going to start working on a new show, it's going to be up in the past exhibition. So it's still available to see on the website, on the brownstoneart.com. And it's still the main show for the next, you know, 24 hours. So yeah. remind all your friends and contacts to go, you know, have a last look, you know, put the pressure on, go check it out. We'll do. We'll do. We're looking forward to see what you do next as well. So yeah. Have an announcement in a couple Thanks, of weeks. Omar. Thank yeah. you. It was great seeing all you guys. Great putting the faces to all the work. Yeah, right. Uh, okay. Some nice surprises there. Uh people that I've known in the past. Uh thank you, David. You know, and you guys for putting it all together, making me part. Thanks for being uh, and here. you guys are amazing. I'll check out your show. Thank you. So yeah, yeah it was great seeing everybody. Take care, David. Thank you very your much. Amazing uh, wizardry over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Love your work. Thanks. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you, David, Josh, Taylor. I really appreciate your inclusion in all of this. It's really, really a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks to all the artists. Thank you for the interviews. Thank you for talking. We, we, we really enjoyed meeting all of you. It was fantastic. Yeah. Cool.